Hello and welcome to the Human Echoes Podcast. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. We're coming to you through video. This is insane. I'm staring into like the evil eye of this little webcam instead of our general sitting there, you know, staring at web browsers. Assuming that this works, and if it doesn't, then you're making more work for yourself to cut this out. Yeah, pretty much. But <laughs> for those of you, if it does work, for those of you listening to the audio podcast, you're like, man, I want to find out what these two guys look like. No, you don't. Yeah, you don't really. Want imagine, you want to imagine you... me as like the like the supple, or maybe not so much supple. Like <laughs> I, I want to be like the giant. Like I want I want to be like long haired. I don't know. I just want to be a Viking. Why Why is that so hard to like? Why Why can't I have that? We could get you a wig. I've already got a wig for my Kevin Smith like Silent Bob outfit. We could pull that out. No, we've done enough setup for tonight. We're coming to you from the land of technical difficulties. Is what this is, or maybe well, not even technical difficulties, just technical. Yeah, <sighs> uh, from the land of beta testing. You, although you did have technical difficulties yesterday, because man, that was a hassle and a half. We tried to record on Saturday. This is Sunday night. We tried to record on Saturday, and Tony texts me at nine o'clock, and we're supposed to record. He's like, "I'll be on the phone for like five more minutes." Just hang on. And I'm like, all right, and hang on. Two hours later. It wasn't two hours, but it was like 30 minutes. And I said, dude, I got. I've been on the phone for two hours at that point. Oh, so... yes. Yes, that is true. <laughs> um, like, I waited 30 minutes. I was like, listen, I i don't think I've got enough time now to finish recording. And then we had an hour meeting anyway, so. Yeah, I was thinking about that. It's like, well, we could have, but, you know. Well, for one thing, I figured. Do you ever want to record a podcast after you've been on hold with tech support for however I, long it was? Two hours? You could have channeled my anger. We could have done something with that. It could have been this furious, like... Do, do you want to talk about it now? Because I think now that now that you've gotten through and sort of mellowed down, we can make something out of it. Yeah. Well, like, it's it's basically... I've been trying to get on the Ting Network, which is eventually going to be one of the sponsors that we have on here because they're awesome. Okay. But... Because of Sprint, I bought a Sprint phone knowing that it could be transferred to Ting. On February 15th, a law went into the book saying that if you had a, a device that was paid off, you, uh, the, the carrier had to unlock it so you could go to another network. But Sprint found a loophole in that law saying that unless it was manufactured after February 15th, 2015, you don't have to do that. So they decided to lock down their old devices that they were unlocking all over the place beforehand as like some way to just hurt customers or something like that. I don't know. I'm not the one who makes these decisions. It's stupid. And I spent like 12 hours trying to get them to unlock it. They didn't tell their customer service people that there's uh, this isn't just a standard phone unlock, that it actually has to meet a federal uh, or this financial eligibility check where it has to have had an account attached to it for a certain amount of time then you cancel it, then you do all this other stuff. So I had to go and like sign up for Sprint, pay the activation fee, do all these other things just to get it unlocked and go through all this just so that they could cancel it, take it all off of there and set it back. And as of a few hours ago, I'm finally able to actually use the network I want, got my number transferred over, all that good stuff. So it's finally done, but it's such crap. I hate dealing with, like, I'm a, I'm a phone support tech now. Like, I'm a PC help desk technician. I take phone calls like that all day. So I know whenever, like, whenever someone's kind of not knowing what they're talking about, I see it whenever the other people I work with are just kind of fumbling through. I hear it on the phone when they don't know what they're talking about. And it's just infuriating whenever you know that they just need to ask somebody else or connect you with somebody else and not just give you jargon over and over and over again. Yeah, that's the worst part. But, I mean, you, so there's the two angles there because there's the empathy, right? Like, it's like, I know what you're going through, dude. I talk to people who don't know what they're talking about all the time. I understand how hard your job is, but I also know that you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you need to learn what you're talking about or get to somebody who does. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's but so yeah, it was, it was mostly just that over and over and over again. Like I, I timed it and it was over 12 hours spent on the phone with tech support this week. Like total? Yeah. Like not like I started at one o'clock and then on and off I was on until one o'clock in the evening or whatever. Like, no, like I was literally writing down how many hours it took. Like I'd be like, well, that was a forty-five minute call. This one was thirty minutes. This one was an hour and twenty-five minutes. Like what is, I, actually, what do you, I, this is a personal question, Tony. So feel free not to answer it. But what do you get paid by the hour at your current job? Twenty-one dollars. So twenty-one dollars an hour 
for 12 hours on the phone with tech support. Uh, Some dollars, 250 bucks, something like that. Yeah. Cost. How much did you pay for the phone? I paid 270 for the phone outright. Digging into Tony's finances here. <laughs> I bought the phone, like I bought a Nexus 5, I brand new, I $270, really nice phone, I like it a lot. What was the deal there? You were trying to did you keep your did you keep your original number? Yes. Okay, good. Cuz I didn't, actually didn't text you today. I put sent you a message on WhatsApp cuz I was like I don't know if Tony's number still works cuz he got a new phone. I sent you a message where I was like test, please tell me if I'm ki- if you're getting this. Oh, no, no. Did you send me a text message or on WhatsApp? I sent you a text. I, I didn't a, get the text. Because for about an hour I wasn't getting texts or calls in, but I was able to send stuff out. It was just uh, the stuff that happens whenever you transfer a number over. It needed a little more time to configure everything. I but everything's all kosher now. I didn't get the text, Tony, but I saw the message on WhatsApp, and I purposely did not reply just to freak you out. <laughs> I was hoping that Joseph would also not reply. We would just be like, leave you hanging for the no, rest of the uh, night. Does it work? That's the reason why I send messages out to like 14 people, because why beta test something with one person whenever you can bother a dozen? <laughs> yeah. Well, l- luckily, Joseph is not as much of a troll as I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, I don't know about that. Sometimes he can troll pretty hard. He, like, he, he messed with you on it, like, but he replied in a fashion that let you know, oh, okay, he got the message. He's messing with me, but he got the message. <sighs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm just glad you got all just, that out of the way. Yeah, I know and how now, frustrating. I would not do it. For 12 hours, I just, like, I would, I would just be like, well, this phone doesn't work, and it's sad. No, I, like, I'm a cheap ass for a lot of things, and that's one of the things. That I wasn't able to text you guys or work on work while I was at work, so I couldn't work on the podcast stuff or respond to people tweeting at us or anything like that, and that was, like, so isolating and freaky to me for, like, the past two weeks. I've just been trying to, like, break out of that and be able to contact people outside because my cell phone didn't work at home or at my work. Like it just, I couldn't do anything. It was bad and it was dumb. What network were you on previously? T-Mobile. Oh yeah. They're not very good here either. Yeah. They, they are fine if you're in like a ranch house above ground, but not a garden level apartment or an office building with brick. So basically I'm just sitting there like twiddling my thumbs at work between calls whenever I could be working on other important things and their network is a lot more locked down than my previous job, so I can't go and like edit a bunch of stuff for posts or anything like that. So yeah, we of... do a lot of our work from the phone. Yeah, Not, that's that's incredible how technology progresses, where you can, you know, do all that stuff from like a mobile device. I just it's in your pocket, and you can be. You could almost do every well, not everything. The video editing and stuff, and the recording, you can't quite. You know, oh, you can do a stuff. fair amount of sound editing. Do what? You can do a fair amount of sound editing. There's a lot of people who record their podcasts and just do it through like GarageBand on an iPad or something like that. Like you can do a fair amount through uh, the, for the mobile devices now. Yeah, it's it's definitely but, just incredible how much stuff is available to us. We are in the future, Tony. And with this, I'm just going to be uh, like I'll I'll be able to tether it to the laptop I have at work and do like. If I need to actually do something, I can take care of it instead of feeling like I'm a mooch. And I mean, I should feel like a mooch. They're paying me twenty bucks an hour, and I'm sitting there like on the side doing everything else. But whatever. Let me use your Wi-Fi <laughs> to do my podcast thing. <laughs> it's the thing that like keeps people sane. They should understand that. Is that what it is? Is it a mental health issue? Yeah, it's it's like literally. No, like, you, you don't understand. I know you're paying me to do work, but I'm gonna go crazy I do, if I don't post I do on the work, podcast Twitter work. account. I gotta do work while I'm doing work because I like doing work whenever I'm getting paid to actually do something else, you know? Yeah, maybe, kinda. <laughs> I don't get that option. Like when I'm actually in the midst of doing work, like my hands are are full all the time. The only time I get to not do work is when I'm like, sort of in the downtime where we're just sort of making up work. Yeah, Which we happens. have some doubts of that. Like uh, it was just a stressful week for dealing with tech stuff because I got to be on tech. I got to be on hold there, and then I got to put people on hold all day because, like, oh yeah, because you were on the other end of that. Got like reset at the same time. What? So everyone who didn't pay attention to the little notification, their password was getting reset, had to call me to unlock their account. So much anger. 
So you you were the guy who was getting called like, I just want my password reset. Why can't you do this? You're like, <sighs> I, I, I can. You Why? have instructions. <sighs> people are dumb. Yeah, that was where I, I I know I can't talk about like exactly what I heard, but people want they they don't want to go through the whole like. The, reset my password thing that you have to go through so they freak out and they're like just set my password too and uh, you find out a lot about people from the passwords they use there's some creepy creepy things in that I, I, I wish I wasn't bound by HIPAA laws not to say anything but like you just get into like these weird weird like kind of dark places with people were there any 50 shades of gray references uh, there was one that had handcuffs in there okay and I think they were a school resource officer, so it kind of makes more sense. How does that make sense? I don't understand that. Because they walk around with handcuffs all the time? That that kind of just makes it more creepy, Tony. <laughs> it's like, oh, I understand why they have that job now. But I'm like, enjoying some, this a little too much. Yeah, some of it was just like... I'll, I'll paraphrase what the password was, but it was like a, an elder woman with Mommy Loves Me Forever. And just weird stuff like that. Oh, and it's wow. Just, it's just so odd to me. <sighs> you get people, people are weird, man. What are you going to do? Yeah. And then there's a lot where it's like, my dog's name is Chester. Can he be my password? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <this> is... <laughs> I'm like, sure. Just, you know, bring Chester in. We'll verify. It. <laughs> you have to egg in his fingerprint, his paw print. <laughs> Chester, do you solemnly swear to be this person's password? I had to set up a new fingerprint machine that, like, reports directly to the FBI today. Or not today, on Friday. Oh, the creeping long arm of the law getting into us now, huh? Yeah, pretty much. It's like, they don't drug test us for working at a school, but they definitely fingerprint you and do a FBI background check. Yeah, that's a good, that's probably a good policy. Yeah, they figure if you got through the interviews, you're probably not doing that much heroin. I do like that they don't drug test you in the state where marijuana is legal. I imagine <laughs> there are some places that do, and it must be a real bummer for the people who are like, it's legal, but I can lose my job. Yeah, my sister is like on a rotating schedule of like randomized drug tests. Like it could be three weeks, it could be six months, that sort of thing. And they're like, it's a Canadian company, very conservative, like loan agency. So they're all about like making sure nobody does it. Because you could come into work high and cost us all this money. <laughs> Is that what that subprime loan mor- lo- mortgage thing was all about, Tony? <laughs> They're just all the bankers are just like high on weed. And they're like, man, it's so good. You get a loan, and you get uh, a loan, and I trust you. You're a good man. <laughs> you you promised sandwich. You promised me you're gonna get this back. You know. I mean, back, right? we're, like we're talking about like some some real love here, man. I just want your business to be successful, but you're gonna pay it back no matter what, right? Promise? Okay. <sighs> now I understand <laughs> the crisis that we're in, Tony. Four twenty has killed this country. <laughs> <sighs> we oh. should talk about the movie eventually here. Probably. The movie that we watched is called Trans. No. Predestination. I was about to. I was, I was about to. I was sitting there like, "Is he going to get it right? Did he watch the right movie?" <laughs> Trans destination. It was just kind of part of the theme. And by the way, we're going to have to probably spoil a lot about this movie. We're going to try to keep it like we're going to keep it in check for a little bit, but to really dig into some parts, like you got to start revealing things that happen. I kind of want to avoid. I don't know this movie about time travel. And we're going to say that up front. We're not going to do the thing that everybody did with the one I love, where they won't tell you what the freaking movie is about, because somehow that's a big spoiler. And oh my gosh, if you know what it's about, it's ruined, because you went into it and you knew what it was about. Like, there's a movie about time travel, and there's time travel tough. shenanigans in there. But I, would, I, don't, I don't think we need to spoil, like, the Well, end. we don't have to spoil all the big reveals, but we do have to go into some things that are revealed after, like, 40 minutes or so. Okay. I'll At like, least we'll see. <laughs> this is a weird portion where we like negotiate how much we're willing to reveal. <laughs> go back and forth like, well, should we go this far? No, no, no. We don't want to tell them about that. There's so many. The thing about this movie is there are like there is a moment in this movie, probably 20 or 30 minutes in. That is a twist 
that would be the end of most other movies. And it's just the start of a whole cascade of, like, paradoxical time travel weirdness uh, that I, I found really, really compelling. This, there are not enough good time travel movies, in my opinion. Um, but Predestination, I'm putting it on my list of time travel movies that I've really dug. And I'm sad because it didn't get, like, a wide release. I don't think it ever went to theaters, at least not very many of them. It basically just came out VOD, and it's got Ethan Hawke in it. I don't know who the uh, the other actor is, but it's like uh, Sooks or something like that, or Snooks, something like that. I we need to look it up, but now all of a sudden I don't have a computer in front of me, so it's a little bit weird. I can pull it up. I can pull it up. I'll, I'll <laughs> pull. I'll, I'll pull it up on my screen that you can see behind me. Um, but yeah, the um, it just I, and I thought that it was an amazing, amazing film. Like it may be not quite to the caliber of Looper, but it's a different type of film than Looper was. Uh, Sarah Snook is the other main actor. Um, fantastic in this movie. There's a lot. She's that she so has. good. There's so good performances, Tony. I'm just, wow. Wow. Oh, I was he, blown I, away. Ethan Hawke felt natural in this role, and I've had problems with him in the past where I just couldn't see him either doing the action that he was asked to do or just things that I didn't really dig on from some of his movies. But I really liked him in this, and she, like, she's about to explode from the looks of that. She's got, like, seven movies that are in, like, post-production and everything right now. She was in that Annabelle movie that's on uh, Netflix. Like, it just feels like she's poised to be in, like, be a big thing for a while now, especially after a performance like this. Well, the thing is, though, nobody saw it. Like, I'm just bothered by the fact, and we'll talk about the movie specifically in a little bit, but she gave such a powerful performance, and Ethan Hawke, there's, like, I mean, the majority of the beginning of this movie is just them two sitting in a bar talking to each other. She's telling him a story, it'll flash to the story, but just the scenes between them and the bar, if you didn't have the flashovers and it was just between them... That still would have been more powerful than a lot of the performances I've seen from anybody. And for both of them, they had great chemistry together. He played his part really well. She was she brought so much emotion to that role. The there is a tw- the, the twist, I guess, when you'll know it because you know, we're talking about her as a female actor, but when you first see her, the first twist that they have in the movie, he goes to this bar and meets her. He's working for some weird shadowy organization that isn't fully explained, but turns out to be some time travel government group. They're a time travel bureau, I think. Oh, by the way, I want to correct also. Earlier I had said that uh, this was based on a Philip K. Dick story. I apologize. Fans of Robert Heinlein, forgive me. Robert Heinlein yeah. story, not Philip K. Dick. The late Robert Heinlein. Yes. Uh, and a great Robert Heinlein story. Sad that the title had to change. I understand why it had to change. It was originally called All You Zombies. Uh, was written in 1960, which was eight years before Night of the Living Dead sort of redefined what zombies were. Um, I think it still kind of works in context, but, you know, now to put zombies in the title of a film, you're going to be suggesting something that is not at all true. So uh, there's it's not a zombie film. (laughs) It's a metaphorical idea of zombies. Um, But they, like, just... It was so good when she she the, the beginning of the movie. You th- she's dressed as a man. She's playing a man who's been through a sex change, and so you start off the movie. And I, I at the beginning, I really really saw her as a as a guy. And then once she revealed, oh no, I used to be a woman. I kind of like started to see her in that light, even though it was you know supposed to be a him. If that makes does that make sense to you, Tony? Or did you pick up on it right away? Were you just like, no, that's a girl. The person I was with picked up on it five seconds in. Oh really? Like, oh, that oh. guy's rather or that uh, they're really androgynous. I bet that's a I bet you they used to be a woman. Ah, okay. Like, and they was got, the person you were with a female? Yes. Ah, they have a better eye for that stuff. Yeah. She also has several friends that are like that are female to male, like transitionary, like or trans people. Okay. So I think she's just had more exposure than I, because I was like that kind of that guy kind of has feminine features, but it wasn't like overpowering. Right. Well, once she, once you saw her as a woman, then it kind of like stuck in your mind. You're like, oh, okay, I get it. But uh, so she's 
he he shows up in this bar. You're not sure why he's there, but it's apparent that he's there to meet her for some reason. And they talk, and he's basically he's just kind of shooting the bull with her. Like you yeah. know, like, it's it's interesting because he's on this mission. Like you've seen his supervisor tell him. You need to go to this, you know, go and do this thing and take care of this or whatever. But they're kind of vague about what exactly it is he's supposed to be doing. And then you see him in this bar, tending the bar, and he, this customer just comes in and sits down. And he's like, he just basically talks to her for a while, talks to him, I should say, for a while. And, you know, it comes out, the person, this guy's like, I've got, I've got a story you will not believe. He's like, well, try me if it's the, you know, he said, basically says, I bet you this bottle of liquor that, you know, this is not the best story I've ever heard. And the person says, oh, yeah, well, and then she, he goes into it and starts out, you know, this person who you think is a guy, at least I did, uh, starts out the story when I was a little girl. And <laughs> Ethan Hawke's like, what? Uh, <laughs> or at least acts that way. And then yeah. she's like, you know, he's like, finish, let me finish the story. I'll tell you. And goes through one of the most heart wrenching stories that I have ever, and like I, that I could imagine. It just it was one of those things that just like everything is getting piled on this woman. Well, you expect it to be like a two or three minute segment. Like you expect it to be like some really quick sob story, but this it goes on for like forty minutes of just building up how she got to this point. And not like in a bad way. You say it goes no, on. I didn't think it was. It wasn't like oh, did you just get to the end already. No. I I think the reason why it seemed a little bit bigger to me is because I was sitting there and I was like, all right, I have to go to the bathroom. As soon as the scene is over, I'm going to. And that scene didn't end for like 45 minutes. So I think that put the urgency or the length of the scene in mind for me. Oh, okay. I was just like, <laughs> the weird thing for me was I had this movie, me and my wife took a little mini vacation and I just picked this movie out of the red box. And I was like, eh, I've seen some things. This looks kind of cool. I'm going to check it out. Uh, why don't you pull, pull it out of the red box? She says, okay. We were at our hotel. Well, there wasn't a whole lot on TV. I was like, let's pop this in. And I just, we just watched the movie. Like, it was one of those movies that sucked me in to the point where I forgot that I might have been ready to go to bed or get bored or something. You know, it was, we just watched the whole thing all the way through. And we were like, wow, that was really incredible. I'm really hoping that this movie ends up picking up like a, a good DVD following because it was actually uh, checked out of four different red boxes I went to. Oh, really? One of the double red boxes, and like the guy in line in front of me took the last one from that one, and thankfully the other machine had it. It took literally five different red box machines to find this thing in. You need to get the red box app on your phone, Tony, and reserve things. Yeah, that would that would actually make sense, but I was I was just driving around. Well, that's okay, I guess. Fool. I could have just checked it out and probably gotten offer updates, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, they do. They'll give you like freebies and like buy one, get one stuff, which unless you have a bunch of people in your house, buy one, get one's just a, a gimmick to get you to keep the DVDs for three or four days. Cause you're not going to watch two DVDs in one night. Yeah. What kind of freak would do that? <laughs> I'm really bad about like a uh, movie marathons lately or good. I guess if that's what you're going for. I'm already finished with like the new season of House of Cards. I finished Big Love. I watched more movies. It's been, it's been kind of bad. Too much sedentary time. We're getting away from the movie though, Tony. We need to continue with the movie. Excuse me. I was me. gonna ask you about House of Cards. I was like, wait a minute. We haven't finished talking about Predestination yet. Yeah, uh, and we got to explain like the job that she was basically trying to get and things like that. Well, yeah. So it's a weird. It's almost like an alternate universe kind of thing, although it's hard to tell if it's alternate universe or if it sounds weird because. It was a fake made up thing, but she applies for this thing called Space Corps because she's felt different. She's a very intelligent girl. Like, she's stronger than a lot of the other girls. She doesn't feel like she fits in. And so she she signs up for this basically astronaut training program for women uh, as sort of a companionship thing, was. Yeah, it was basically like. Steward, like stewardess, prostitute, but you have to be a virgin when you apply, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I guess we should go a step back. She was orphaned. Like, she was basically left at a place. She grew up in a boarding school slash orphanage type situation where she was bullied a lot and felt completely outside of everybody. And then she ends up, whenever they realize that she's smart, at the Space Works place. 
Yes, and well, getting bullied, she was also a very good fighter. So, like we said, she's super strong, and she passed all their tests with flying colors. She just and that, but it was like it was her thing where she's like, "This is my dream. This is the one thing that I'm good at. Finally, I'm good at something." And then she gets kicked out for no reason. It was because she got like in a fight, and during the examination, they found an anomaly. Yes, which they don't go into. But, you know, stuff reveals later on. So she gets kicked out. She decides, okay, fine, I'll move on with my life. She applies to, what is it, secretarial school or something? Something like that. She's, she's learning some kind of a trade that's appropriate for a woman uh, of the time. Because this takes place in, like, the 50s or 60s, late 50s, early 60s. Like so it would have been, I, it couldn't have been into the 60s yet. Okay. And uh, so she meets a guy and, you know, falls in love. This person knows, you know, is, you know, as as close to her heart as anyone ever has been. She's never felt a connection with anybody like this before. And now suddenly she has this connection. They get together. She gets pregnant and the guy leaves. For no yeah, reason. It like leaves in a way that was just horrible, like. There's leaves are sitting there. She's just like, he, I'll be right back. And then just walks away, walks away and never comes back. It's cold. It was super cold. And, and here's the part where we have to stop spoiling Tony. Yeah. Because it's, but I will say what I love about this movie is that it takes all of that suffering, all of that, like misery that you go through with the character because you feel so bad for her and everything has gone bad and it m gives it a purpose. It makes it you, it repurposes it and makes you see it in a different light and gives you something that isn't dark and hopeless and, you know, life is, you know, bitterness and things in a way that very organic and natural and just, I, yeah, I, I don't know how much more I can say without... I don't want to spoil. I really yeah. don't want to spoil this. That's, a, that's the point where, like, it starts getting into the massive spoiler territory. Yes. Like, here onward, like, we can't... We can talk about some details, but we can't really... But it's a beautiful story. Yeah. Um, and... Just... I, it blows your mind, too. Especially if there are some concept in this concepts in this that I have experienced in the past because I am an avid reader of science fiction. At least I have been, I don't read as much of it as, as I used to, but I had encountered stories like this before, but it was so much fun watching my wife watch this. And when we got to the end, her like, what, 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 how did, but no, with the, and she like, she, her mind was just blown for like 15 or 20 minutes where she was just thinking about like what had happened in this movie. There is not a better time travel centric movie out there. Like there are other movies that are very, very good with time travel as their focus. But in Looper, the time travel isn't the point, right? It's a plot yeah. device that gets used, but you don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's it's more it's an answer. It gets the story going, but yeah, in, and it also doesn't linger on a lot of things like that. The the way the time travel works, like it's basically he is a violin case that's a time machine. You have to be within three feet, and it works. And that's pretty much all there is to it. I like the details of it too because they they talked about you know he's in the seventies or whatever at this point when he when he meets her slash him finally. Um, and he says he ends up, you know, telling about the time machine and his he, he says, well, you can't go more than 51 years away from the creation date. And she says, well, when is that? And he says, uh, it's about 10 years from now, which I like that, like the creation of the time machine is in the future from yeah. where they are. Like, it doesn't matter if you have a time machine. It doesn't matter when you created it because you can send it back in time to the people back back there anyway I, I thought that was just a really cool little quirky rule they didn't give a reason for it and it's not like 
it's because of this thing in the space time continuum. It was just like, <laughs> yep, you can't go more than 51 years. And just little things like that grounded the movie a little bit more. We were like, oh, that's why they're not going back in time and like, you know, killing Genghis Khan or somebody. I guess they could have killed Hitler. Or maybe they... That would have been within the time limit because like she was, I think it was like 42 or something when she was born. Yeah. That also would require a lot of good timing and everything. I'm sure you could have a lot of people go back, but you could also end up losing like 16 people trying to like get in the right position for it. And it all it never works either, right? Like every time you kill Hitler, it always makes things worse in time travel movies. Yeah. But yes, this movie like focuses on the weirdness of time travel and the possible paradoxes and in focusing on that and telling a really good story with all of those aspects, I would say it, it stands alone in how good it is. It's, and, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of primer. I would say f- primers uh, for me, probably on par, but primer, this does, is more fun to watch than primer for it, me. Yeah. Here's the thing. Primer has a lot of complicated stuff and deals with paradoxes a little bit, but primer doesn't show you all the pieces. Like, it's like looking at a clock, the insides of a clock, and some of the gears are invisible. So you can see how one, like, two things are moving and kind of infer maybe this is moving that in primer. But you don't really know. But in Predestination, they show you everything, and it still blows your mind. You're like, yeah, wait, I I just saw all that. I know how all these pieces connect. But, jeez, how does this work? I was I was very happy with it. It's it's a unique experience. If you like time travel, the concept at all, you gotta see this movie. If you like good movies, the be- I will say the sec- so you get to the sex change part of the movie where uh, Jane turns into John, and probably my favorite scene in the movie from an acting standpoint is when she's sitting on the bed. She's just had the sex chains, and she's trying to, or he now is trying on his new identity. And keeps, like, says, hello, my name is John. Hello, my name is John, trying to affect a deeper voice. And then, like, breaks down a little bit and says, hello, my name is Jane. How are you? Like, to nobody. Just, like, talking to the empty room. But you can see her, like, I've already been through all this crap, and now I had to get turned into a man because of some medical emergency? What? (laughs) Yeah, that was, like, that was so messed up, too. Like, I, she... She has her child. They find out that she has, like, both working organs. She's a hermaphrodite, basically. And then they're like, well, we just decided to make you into a man while you were unconscious. I, Completely yeah, there not- was, like, some kind of... It seemed like maybe it was medically necessary, but they didn't really explain that. It's just like, oh, yeah, you're a man now. I would say that if there was a shortcoming of the movie, that might be it. It's like, why, why exactly did they do this? See, I, I put a weird assumption on that, that they just assumed that if you had the option, you would want to be a man. <laughs> uh, okay. Especially in the 1950s. That actually might not be too bad of an assumption, although given her it's, reaction, I don't think it was fair for her. <laughs> I know, I'm just saying, that was the thought I had whenever I was trying to figure out how. It's like, oh, it's a 50s doctor. Of course you'd think everybody wants to be a man. <laughs> I can impress. <laughs> He's trying to fix her. He's like, oh. <laughs> It's the ultimate healing. And turn a woman into a man. <sighs> <laughs> but anyway, yes, I recommend this movie highly. It's in Redbox. I assume that very shortly it will be in uh, on Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime and things like that. And you yeah, should it's already on Amazon Prime for five bucks. You can rent it. Like it's on no, I'm Com- at Prime for Com- free. Like oh yeah, I, I'm yeah. You can get the instant video thing as well if you want to pay for the rant- rental fee. It's like I said, it's in Redbox. I'm shocked that this did not get a theatrical release, but it didn't, and you should see it now, because it's that good. Yeah. Uh, one of the better movies I've seen probably all year. Uh, not I, even I, just I, speculative. Piece, like, a, like, I had heard of this first from io9, talking about like how it was one of the smartest and best time travel movies they'd seen in years. So I think that this is this is the type of movie you're getting kind of on the ground floor of. It's going to be one that actually I think it gets a cult following over time. It's going to be like Primer and a lot of these other movies that people are talking about. Although speaking of uh, you know wider release and kind of just the mechanics of movie making, one of the interesting things to me is that there aren't any big set pieces in this movie. Like ninety percent of the scenes take place 
indoors, either on a set or, you know, on some... Like, this movie, from a shooting standpoint, other than paying Ethan Hawke to be there and the actors and stuff, must have been, like, really cheap. This is the type of movie, if you, like, if, if you had the right schedule for it, because there were so few sets, you could probably film in two to three weeks and just be done with it. And put well, this a lot out. of movies don't take much longer than that anyway. I think the most expensive sets would be, like, when they're at the agency, and that wasn't But even that, that isn't, like... I don't imagine it's going to be too bad to build. Yeah. And, like, the the time machine effects are more just, like, a hard cut where they disappear. It's not, like, flashing lights and all sorts of crazy stuff happening all around them. Well, yeah, and it's, uh... They do have the things, like, blow away, you know, as they, they do. Yeah, they have a little bit of an effect. It's like, whatever, uh, he, he travels in a car and all the windows shatter. Stuff like that would be a little bit... But still, I mean, I mean, it's hard for us to do. But from a, from a like a Hollywood movie standpoint, we're talking something very, very inexpensive. I don't see a budget here at all. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't disclosed. But it looks like it was uh, an Australian film, actually. Yep. Okay. So this and the Rover came from the same production companies in Australia, which is pretty two well, pretty we strong. Check out what else they're doing because those guys are on the ball. Yeah. Uh, very different films, obviously, but wow. Just wow, is all I yeah. got to say. So, uh, but that that is basically that would wrap up. We I think everything I have to say about predestination that isn't spoilery. Yeah, we might even have to cut that. We didn't spoil very much. <laughs> I, I hopefully we don't have to cut very much. But y'all need to watch this. Like cut the the preface at the beginning about it. Oh yeah, well. Yeah. Anyway, if we feel like but, editing that, Tony, we can. Yeah, mostly like. <laughs> We're just gonna say you really need to see this while it's like I uh, while it's in Redbox and give it a month if you're poor and wait for ta- uh, Netflix. This is probably the one I'd recommend more than any I've seen probably the last three or four months. Well, I mean that's on de- that's that's out not in theaters. I mean Kingsman's pretty good, Tony. Yeah, it definitely was. Well, it's a different that's a different experience. It's not as high minded and heady. It's a big action thing and yeah. Uh, but you know there are other good movies we've seen this year. But uh, yeah. this one is this, just special. This movie had a couple quick action sequences, but nothing like Colin Firth going off in the Kingsman. <laughs> no, nothing at all like that. <sighs> I'm really happy about this movie. I'm I'm happy to find the hipster in me gets so excited when I find something. Although I'm sad that people haven't heard of it as much. I, I'm very excited to find something that ha- isn't on everybody's radar, and it's good. And I'm, I get to tell people like, look at this. This is the best because I feel that's yeah, not a so bad it's good type thing that we usually find. <laughs> that's that. No, I usually find those, Tony. Let's be real. Yeah, I'm not going to force you to watch them. Yeah, you're it's building up a tolerance, sadly. <laughs> your, your thin is get, your thin is getting skicker. Your skin <laughs> is getting thicker is what I meant to say. It's, it's got me to the point where I'm like super excited to see zombie beavers. I oh, yeah, we got to either. Yeah, we're, we got to do an episode on zombie beavers for sure. Yeah, I was spamming the the people on their Twitter account for trying to get us like review copies so that we could do it like a same day release. Well, we can do VOD. I know, but I just want to do like I want free stuff, and I want it to be all official that we were one of the ones that broke the first reviews. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> that movie looks insane, though. I watched the trailer again yesterday. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, for a given definition of insane, yes, it does. <laughs> <sighs> Speaking of things that look insane, I assume you've seen the new Avengers trailer? I might have. The one where they're like, is that all the, is that everybody you've got? Oh, and yeah, then- yeah, I saw that one. I, like, I'm worried about watching more trailers because I don't want to be spoiled anymore, but, like, I have to watch every time, like, the Avengers releases one. Well, they don't, this is the last one, so. Yeah. I mean, they'll probably have some TV spots and things, but this is the last full-length trailer that they're going to release, so they only had the three. It's only going to be chopped up pieces of these three trailers, if it is. Probably, the yeah. Is much different from the uh, from the first one, but this definitely had some differences. And this one, I think. So I really, really like the first one. I didn't care for the second trailer. I'm not going to lie. Like I, I didn't hate it, I, but it didn't do anything more for me. It's, I was already excited for the movie after I saw the first one. I'm like, this is awesome, hooray! Uh, you know, sometimes we talked about this in the past, where like you really like a movie and you're worried that you really liked it. What if the sequel's not going to be as good? And the first, the the first trailer just got me like, okay, 
I'm at least hopeful that this can be close to as good as the first one. Yeah. And then the second one dropped, and I was like, okay. I mean, it didn't show me anything really exciting or new or anything I could jump up and down about, or maybe a couple more seconds of the Hulkbuster, but that was it. Uh, and I don't care if you, I mean, if you liked it, that's great. I just didn't do much for me. But this third one, like, it really, really got me where I was hoping the second one would get me because – you get all the action, you get a lot of the stuff from the first one, but you also get that Avengers style humor that yeah. is missing in a lot of those. When you know it's going to be there, it's Joss Whedon writing it. It's a Marvel movie. They always advertise these things. But it's super dark. Everybody's going to die. We're not all going to make it out of this. I'm not doing this thing Sunday. <laughs> um, like they, it's. I've talked about this before, but getting burned by Iron Man three made me realize they're not going to make any really dark movies, guys. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be, you know, there, maybe somebody will die, but it's still going to be a Marvel Avengers movie, and you're going to have fun with it. Yeah. I I think it's going to be Hawkeye. You think it's going to be Hawkeye? See, okay. <laughs> he's the Everybody, only... Expect- he's too easy, though. Everybody's yeah. expecting that. Nobody would care. They'd be like, oh, great. That's my I'm problem. If you're going to kill somebody problem. off, kill off a person that everybody's going to be like, oh, What? I wanted it to be Captain America for the they longest get time. For other movies too. Do what now? But he's like, a, like he's got those other movies coming out. So unless they're gonna like Lazarus pit him or something. Okay. First of all, that's not how the Lazarus <laughs> pit. Well, no, yeah, that would be the Lazarus pit. But the, <laughs> um, the what for they can do with Captain America is true. Captain America can be somebody else. True. It doesn't say Steve Rogers. The Winter Soldier. It says Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Yeah. If somebody else picks up the Captain America mantle, as they have done in the comics. uh, Like Civil War is the next one. Right. So, like, I'm doubting that they would have a replacement for that one already. Why? Why? They set it up at the end where Bucky's like, I'm finding myself. I'm not an evil guy anymore, but I'm not sure what I am. If Cap saved him from being an evil guy and he's like, I feel like I need to repay for all of my years of being an evil guy. I just think that transition would happen during the civil war movie. Maybe. I don't know. My, but my vision of people, what would happen if Captain America like Stark, because like they keep having to pay him more and more and more. I, uh, yeah, I don't know about that. I think he might have lost a little bit of his leverage when the judge came out. Yeah. And he realized that nobody cares about any of his other movies. I said nobody. I mean, I didn't see the judge, and I'm not knocking it per se. I'm just saying, like, it didn't do very well. Like, that was a movie that I'd really enjoy. Yeah, the the trailers didn't do much for me. It looked... I just... Anyway. But that may give them a little bit of, like, hey... Do you actually want people to like you? Because you know you like playing Iron Man, and we can get somebody else. Uh, you know, there's there's all that negotiating back and forth, and man, talking about negotiating, that Spider Man they got in a, a Marvel now is just that must have been the most headache inducing legal slash contractual battle ever. Yeah. Well, like, to to get Sony or Disney to uh, decide that they were going to allow, like, the other company to get, like, royalties on something, that would be, I don't even know what it would take. It would be insane. Well, they're not, I'm, everybody's getting paid, Tony. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, they're not getting paid on, like, the movies where Spider-Man is working for Disney. So, like, Disney's not getting paid from Sony Spider-Man movies. They're not, like, doing profit sharing over the movies. Each company that makes the movie gets to keep the rewards from it. Did you know that for a fact? Because I guarantee you, if I was Sony, I'd be like, listen, we we will hammer out a deal for Spider-Man, but you will pay us out the wazoo for every movie that you put him in. See, I thought it was more of like a neutral thing that came out. At least that's what Reddit was saying. They, okay. They've said a lot of stuff in their press releases, and I don't believe none of it, because they've also said that Sony has complete creative control over everything Spider-Man does, and they ain't, Marvel ain't doing that. All right? Yeah. Marvel is not saying, listen, we know you screwed up the last Spider-Man film you did and basically killed that franchise, and we have, like, basically, not a flawless track record, because there are Marvel movies that people don't like, but their whole franchise in general is just really strong. They're not going to Mar- or say to Sony, why don't you take over the writing of this Spider-Man character in the Avengers? 
whatever Avengers or you know wherever he shows up. They're not going to let them do that. They're going to say, listen, guys, we have a plan. We've had a plan for a long time to use Spider-Man. We don't have to have him. We can put somebody else in there if we need to. It can be Black Panther. But you're going to play ball with us and do what we tell you to do. And you can say on your little, in your little press release, we can retain full control of Spider-Man. But if you're not listening to us, you're in trouble. <laughs> That's how I feel like that goes down. Because Sony needs a shot in the arm. This is good for both companies, by the way. I feel like this is a, a mutual win. But yeah. Sony just needs to listen to Marvel and say, okay, you guys, you've been doing right by your character so far. We trust you with Spider-Man. Why don't you? And they've even got the Russo brothers now who did Captain America, uh, the Winter Soldier. They directed that for Marvel. Now they're in contract with Sony for a quote unquote first look deal. Mm. How much do you want to bet that first look is something with Spider-Man or the Sinister Six or. Yeah, they're 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 migrating their people over into Sony to make sure that things go right. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting uh, that. Or I, I wonder if those negotiations were like whenever North Korea and South Korea were talking during that war and it just like drops between – it's like today we can't negotiate any longer because their chairs are taller than ours. They think they're superior. Like you hear about all that sort of stuff during like the Vietnam War and everything that causes just everything to fall apart over stupid little things like that. I hope not. I don't – I like to believe that generally the people in these studios aren't nearly as factious – as the people who are fans of the studios. Um, I don't, I don't like, you know, Marvel and Warner brothers are making, you know, you have the Marvel guys and the DC guys, right? I don't feel like that Marvel hates Warner brothers. You better not make a good Batman movie. Oh, (laughs) like (laughs) they're, they're probably not going to let each other use it. You know, their characters, but I think in general, they're gonna, you know, they, they want good movies to come out from each, you know, from each, uh, studio. I don't know. I think a lot of the people that are executives on those boards are complete psychopaths, and they just want to bury each other. Why? <laughs> why, why, why? What evidence do you have of this, Tony? Because of the twelve hours I spent on the phone with Sprint, and I think that all people who make decisions like that don't care about human beings. <laughs> okay. That's it. Well, if Sprint makes a movie company, we can start <laughs> worrying about it. Well, I'm more talking about, like, in general, like, the people that are the heads of those corporations just don't care. The people that are on the boards don't care. They're on the boards for 11 different companies. Well, I'm talking they, about, like, not the boards, but I'm talking about the people who are creative. I'm sure Joss Whedon doesn't want to see them make a terrible Batman movie because he's a fan of comics. But I'm talking about the people that make decisions on negotiations and things like that. I don't think that they're, like, technically human anymore. All right, but you got to know, okay, so... The people who are making those negotiations, all right, in Marvel's camp, you have Kevin Feige is the, like, sort of head honcho guy of Marvel, all right, and he loves comics, and he's part of the reason why they're so successful, all right, and now Warner Brothers has a different guy named Kevin who's, I I forget what his last name is, Hujitara or something, anyway, he's in control of their uh, cinematic universe for for their comic book movies, Um, and those are both creative people, they're people who want to see a cool thing get made you know they yeah. may not be out there I'm not shooting it about the people that are trying to create this stuff i'm talking about the people that are making a 700 page contract on the usage rights for spider-man right but they're like the lawyers may be in the room with these people but i think i gotta believe that the the cre- the people who are in charge i mean kevin feige is in charge of marvel like he can tell the lawyers what we're gonna do and what we're not gonna do the lawyers turn it into legalese but the people who are actually negotiating these contracts are the people who want to make the movies. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't, I don't see like the people that are in charge of these companies actually being empathetic or good people. Most of the time, I've had a lot of trouble reading over this stuff and, you know, 12 hours of sprint. Okay. <laughs> Tony's just, he's done with civilization entirely. He's going to go live out in the woods. Yeah. At least then I can, you know, emet, like take some mescaline and see my own Marvel movies. <laughs> Whoa, wrong <laughs> space Tony, night. Like, what oh. are you doing here? <laughs> Only problem with that is you're doing your own stunts. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, so. did you have any trouble, Tony, switching over into the daylight savings time, which we are now in? Uh, I'm going to have more trouble with it tomorrow morning. Oh, yeah? 
Yeah, like tomorrow morning is whenever I go to work and it's going to be all different because today I woke up and all of a sudden it was noon because I slept in because I didn't sleep very well last night or like the night before. All of a sudden, like I'm like, wow, half my day is gone. Then I remembered it was mo- it would have been 11 otherwise. But yeah, like it'll be okay until tomorrow morning whenever I have to get up and go to work. That that, that one hour really like saved you from having half your day be gone. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, I'm glad I didn't sleep. I would have slept until 11. That would have been better. Noon is like, too far. I mean, I was up until like 3.30 the night before, so like I already got to start on the technical day of Sunday, so. Yeah. I was up till 3.10, and then I, today I woke up at about 9, but I had my nap, so I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> I'm just happy we're going to get back our hour of afternoon light. I love, 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 love the summertime of the light night. <laughs> oh, it's so exciting. Summer. I should... Every single moment is worth its weight in gold. Summer. I need to actually get some vitamin D this year. Oh, yeah? You're going to actually go outside? Yeah, I've been or too cooped up. just going to take some pills? No, I'll just get a light. Okay. I'll be like the, the Russian people up in the up in Siberia that have to have their kids stand around a vitamin D light so they don't get rickets. Oh, so you're not actually going to go outside? I might go outside. Okay. I'd like to go outside more, but there's like people to talk to and stuff like You literally live underground, Tony. I live halfway underground. It's garden level. It's not a basement. It's close enough. You can like poke your head up and see through, like see people's feet walking by. Yeah. By your eyes. (laughs) That's, that's underground. You are in the ground. I'm just indie man. Speaking of in the ground, did you hear about the Toronto tunnel? I did not. (laughs) So they find this tunnel in Toronto. That uh, they're freaking out because they don't know. Um, I, there's a whole bunch of news stories here. I'm not going to read. Uh, basically, in, in Toronto, Canada, they find this this tunnel by near this school campus that's dug like with you know they've got plank boards and stuff, and it goes not super long, but it's like ten or fifteen feet, I want to say. And the cops like start freaking out because they don't know who made it. And there's like a generator by there and they found some like weird rosary with a remembrance day flower, which I think is a English thing that had something to do with basically I made them think like, Oh, these people are some kind of revolutionary political uprising type people. And then they find the guys who made it. And the, 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 the story the next day is, you know, makers of Toronto tunnel found. Used it for personal reasons, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it was, it was the weirdest. It like, was they, an orgy hole. Do what? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. Like they just instantly like backed off. Like yeah, no big deal. <laughs> we were on high alert for two days there because we thought they were terrorists, but nope. Turns out they just like digging holes. It was the sex tunnel. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know if it was that cl- that personal, Tony. I'm not saying I'm not inferring that because it's cold. Like it's wintertime in Toronto, but... and this tunnel is not well provisioned. Yeah, but if you go underground, it like gets to about fifty degrees pretty easily. Let me pull up a picture of it and put it on the screen behind me here, so people can see. <laughs> Apparently, this guy over here with the hat is the person who built it, uh, and you can see there the uh... yeah. They just built a tunnel down into the ground. They even had, like I said, they had a generator. There was all provision and stuff. I don't know exactly what the generator was lighting, but it was doing something. And uh, it sounds like a meth lab setup to me, really. I think if they'd found, well, I was gonna say if they'd found meth, they wouldn't have, you know. Yeah, they announced it. But then again, I realized that this is the town that Rob Ford is the mayor of. So who knows? <laughs> like maybe they're just like oh another meth lab are you guys with Rob Ford they found where Rob Ford keeps his like, like, I don't know steps. that he would fit into that tunnel Tony <laughs> it wasn't that big oh if you get enough butter <laughs> now it is a sex thing <laughs> just imagining like Rob Ford being shoved through a tube and on the other side it's like the play-doh fat from his belly is like all over the place Sitting there talking about how he could beat up Mike Tyson and all this. Oh no, no! <laughs> oh. He just pushed harder. He's mad because he can't reach his crack pipe. 
Like that that that'll incentivize him to get in there. Throw the pipe down there. He's like, I oh, will squeeze in there. <laughs> He'd chew his own arms off to get to it. How is the guy who smokes that much crack that fat? Uh, are you supposed, supposed to be skinny? No, like after a certain point, it makes you like all paranoid and you just don't leave. So like you're just like sitting inside your house, kind of like you're climbing the walls and you're looking all paranoid and you're sweating profusely, but you're also like eating everything and not leaving or going anywhere or doing anything. That's what, like, the difference between, like, crack and cocaine for a lot of people. On cocaine, like, you're going to be talking to someone about how you're going to start this business and you're going to feel really bad the next day because you drank too much while you were on cocaine and you spent all your money. Crack is more like, okay, I've got to find a $3 pipe to shove this thing in and just start token. But they're, like, they're the same chemical, right? It's just in a different form? Well, it's, it's also the way it's imbibed. Like, the, the only difference between crack and, uh, and cocaine is that it uses... Uh, it uses baking soda to kind of make it into a rock form, so it's cut a little bit less. It's not as potent as cocaine. Okay. That's why people have always said that it's a, that it's kind of a racist law because, like, the only place you see crack is usually in like inner cities, ghettos, things like that, and like urban areas. Whereas with like cocaine, it's like Wall Street and stuff like that. Yeah, like if you saw the Wolf of Wall Street, that's all over that place. Yeah, <laughs> it's snowing over there. That's a that's one of the phone calls that I've gotten before, like for people that our friends mind they're like hey is it snowing in your part of town and i'm like no i don't do that quit calling me about it the nsa is listening <laughs> i'm sure they understand your code word for coke <laughs> no i don't have any cocaine nsa person <laughs> it's snowing all over florida <laughs> it is not not in this part anyway yeah that's that's more like miami south florida all we got's the monster right here <laughs> that's it just chugging it down. All the legal stimulants. Oh, by the way, did you see the tweet from uh, Emily Elizabeth the other night? No. All right, so Emily Elizabeth is somehow affiliated with Hannah Elizabeth, uh, wonderful Sherlock madam, on Twitter. Yeah. She changed it back. No more PT barn pun. Yeah, uh, Emily Elizabeth won't follow me because I'm a heathen. Well, you could still follow her. I know. You missed out, though. Okay, so first of all, I retweeted her retweet, her tweet, so you should, like, just, you know, you should have seen it there, because you follow me, don't you, Tony? Yeah, but I haven't been on Twitter that much this weekend. Okay. Well, Emily Elizabeth, somehow affiliated with Hannah Elizabeth, I'm guessing a sister, I don't know if Elizabeth is her last name, I don't know how it is just now that I'm asking these questions, but I was too embarrassed. By the time I thought about, like, the connection, I was like, there's no way that Elizabeth is your last name, right? Anyway, <clears throat> regardless, she sends out a tweet, I want to say Friday night, or maybe it was Tuesday or Thursday night. It was, it was late in the week, and she says, you know the woman from the monster commercial? Like, not the commercial, I'm sorry, like the woman from the monsters made by the devil, and they want you to, you know, they've got 666 and all that? You remember that, Tony? Yeah. yeah. I remember. At her house. Woman was she walked she came home and the woman was sitting at their kitchen table, staying at their house with her parents. Overnight. That's insane. Okay. That for real just happened. We know somebody who knows somebody who stayed in the same house with the monsters of the devil. <laughs> video lady. For people who don't know. Like, this video will be in the link dump because it's absolutely insane and also hilarious. I'll pull it, I'll pull it up and put it up behind me without any sound, though. Uh, I, I have some questions, just so you know. Okay. Some questions. This one actually helps having the video podcast because Joseph Devin has asked for multiple accounts, from multiple places, just what the hell this is. And for those listening on the podcast... Probably a picture you're going to see tweeted out two or three more times about a pink rabbit in space. Oh, should I put up. that up? Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, here's the – I'm just showing the video real quick of the lady showing the monster can. It's behind me here. Uh, she's got her whole spiel. You can go look it up on YouTube. We will have it in the link dump. She has her whole spiel about how the, the little monster things are the 666 and the other stuff on the can. Yeah. I feel very, very blessed to know someone – who knows her? But yeah, let's pull up the pink rabbit uh, so people can see that as well. I put that up to the screen on mine so if people wanted to see it, they can. Otherwise, they can see it on your screen. 
No, they want to see it on my screen, Tony. My screen's the best. <laughs> it's not... Okay. See, it's hard to... Ah, uh, there's too many pink rabbits. Pink space rabbit. There we go. So we've had... Interesting thing. This this tweet has been going around a lot. This image. Yeah, the first time I saw it was uh, from Saladin Ahmed, which I don't follow him, but he's followed by a lot of writers that I know. Yeah, I think I saw him, saw him tweet it as well. And I, actually, at first I saw it on uh, Google+, Plus. weirdly enough. I ventured on there one time and somebody had put this picture up of the space rabbit. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a cover. I think it's a cover of a sci-fi anthology. I'm going to say yeah, that. we had like an investigation going. We had a lot of people like rich Alex and Morgan Post and various other people like digging to find it, but nobody could find like the actual thing for it. So if you guys know where this is from contact at Joseph Devin and put his fears to rest. How do people not know about this? Like, this seems like it's something from the golden age of sci-fi. It definitely looks like it, but it's from a more modern artist. Are you sure? That's what they, that's what their research concluded. Okay. Which I'm is kind of, like, it's, it it's making much it on looks... the podcast. Cause that doesn't make for good podcast material. Yeah. Uh, I, I tried to, I, <clears throat> when we were looking at it initially, I was on my phone and the phone doesn't let you do reverse image search. So I wasn't able to do that much, but maybe it's like an homage to the weirdness of the. Yeah, that's what that's kind of what I thought it was like an homage to the weirdness of that era's sci-fi. Like I sent you guys a picture of that Jupiter thing with like the weird little creatures and how they were saying Jupiter's surface is going to be so much more dense. So <laughs> the only way we'll get around is uh, by tractor. And it's like, well, there really isn't a surface per se, but, you know, good on you guys for putting some interesting aliens together. Oh. Uh... Listen, but, uh, you got everything's a guess. <laughs> you, you know, we, we've never been there either. Maybe there's like some rocks or something down there that you can bounce on or something. Or I saw, maybe like, I had a sci-fi so thing. It's like uh, kind of liquid or something. What? Maybe it's so dense that it pretty much is a solid, even though it's a gas. That's why so- I, it's on the far left side of the table because they consider it possibly a, a solid under the right conditions. Yeah, but by the time you get down there, you're probably squished under the other liquids and stuff, and you can't you can't stand on it if there is a solid down there. Yeah, you've gone space noodle or space puddle or something. But the the I've had a science fiction actually it wasn't science fiction it was a it was a, a book about space, but it had like a speculative fiction thing about like what things might look like on other planets, and I will always remember the one I saw for Jupiter because they had like these giant gas jellyfish things floating in the clouds of jupiter and i thought that is oh i saw that cool. i saw that on sci-fi once like they were talking about beings like that there was like this uh hundred different types of aliens on different planets and all this stuff it was a really cool special they also had this i remember in the same book they had something on the uh moon europa because it had it was a it was a skating alien like it would lived on the surface and it metabolized the energy from jupiter because Jupiter gives off, it's not a sun, that's just, you know, it's not a star, but it, it still gives off a good amount of energy from, uh, you know, the reaction going on inside of it. Yeah. So, it, anyway, very, very cool, you know, concept art. Obviously not anything for real, but... Uh, hey, man, you never know. You saw Europa Report. That was a good movie. We did, we, <laughs> we did cover that. I keep forgetting that we covered yeah. that. That was a solid movie. It was, it was, it was. I keep thinking about it, and there was... Now, although it wasn't perfect, I felt like the ending was a little bit just like, wow, over the top, here we go. But I it really, um, really a lot to like about that movie. Definitely. We do have another question, though, and this is something that I was kind of thinking about the other day. Xander underscore Kane, which is spelled X-A-N-D-E-R underscore K-A-N-E, sent us a message asking, so many film companies have streaming services now. Do you think they will uh, they will all survive, or will they have to join forces? Reason I ask is because it will get costly for viewers to have to subscribe to ten different services. My worry is that they will all uh, remove their films from other streaming services to get the money from their, uh, the films themselves. Uh, like it's why at one point I was it Paramount. It was one of the bigger companies stripped all of their movies from Netflix so that they could start their own streaming service. Yes, that has happened, and I don't... Okay, do you know anybody, Tony, who subscribed to any single studio's streaming service? 
I know a few people that go to that like full moon one because it's all like horror stuff, like classic horror, and it's like five bucks a month. It's Is all that like, from a single studio? Like, I'm pretty sure it's just full moon stuff, but I might be mistaken. What is full moon? Uh, they made lots and lots and lots of horror over the past few decades. Like uh, they made like the Puppet Master series and stuff like that. I did not know that. And like there, I, uh, I think that they might be branching out too because there's also like Horror Net and a bunch of other ones. Like it seems like the more specialized you get, like there's uh, this Iron Dragon TV things like that that are I uh, that aren't just a single company but they're a single genre. So if you really did kung fu movies for like three bucks a month, you get access to their giant library of kung fu movies. But I think that the only way that's going to work is if we start using devices like a Roku where you subscribe to a bunch of channels and you just pay your monthly bill that way. Yeah, I it's don't not- I don't see doing it. I mean, yeah, I like digital a lot. I like digital video, but I think that Netflix has enough of a subscriber base. And they're very th- here's the thing. Netflix is not dumb. All right. So they're they're getting ahead of a lot of these curves producing their own content. You know, they're, they're in with a lot of these smaller distributors so that people who are making things like predestination can get their stuff out there eventually. Um, when they don't have the big cloud of another studio, yes, there are things you can't do on Netflix, but most of the time, if you're just casually wanting to look at a movie, it's the, and you don't want to, you don't have a specific thing in mind. If you have a specific movie in mind, there are other avenues, right? Like, you can rent something off of Amazon Prime or Vudu uh, and go that direction if you're like, I want the specific thing, but it's not on Amazon. Or, I'm sorry, Netflix. But, the like, an individual studio, I don't think... Who follows an individual studio? Like, maybe Marvel, but they don't have enough... Like, I'm not paying, paying a subscription fee to watch, you know, even as many movies as they have. You know, like, that, there's no single studio that I'm like, man, I'm, I can't wait for the next Paramount picture to come out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, most people don't, don't even it? pay attention to that. Well, Disney, if you included, like, some of the other ones they own, because don't they own Universal? I I don't know. They own MGM, I know that. I thought they own Universal. Like, there's a few others. So you could probably make, like, an umbrella product there that covers a lot. And the only thing that would get me... To do that is if it was, like, their entire library, like, no questions asked. And even then, I don't think I'd want to. I just want... I love the Netflix model. Well, I think... I, like I mean, people Netflix. really like the... I'm talking about the old cartoons. As a parent, like, having access to all of those classic cartoons that you know you love and, you know, that are, you know, from that studio. Regardless, they may, they may not all be 100% winners, but they put a lot of work and quality into their stuff. So if they had, like, a, a catalog of all of their basic animated features... You know, you could probably get five bucks a month out of that for a little while, especially yeah. with kids, because kids watch and rewatch and rewatch and rewatch. We we buy a lot of movies that we would normally just rent. But if it's a kid's movie and we like it, we will buy it because especially if we like it, it's nice to have something that isn't Sean the Train for AJ to watch or Paw Patrol. Yeah, are you still uh, are you still okay with cars, or is it finally worn down for you? Uh, well, I'm okay with cars, but he hasn't been like his he's stopped wearing watching that over and over and over again. So now he's into uh, Lego Movie is, is his big thing, and, I, and he's starting to get into uh, Big Hero Six because we just got that. Uh, and to a certain extent, I try to kind of push Cloudy with a chance of meatballs on him because that movie film was amazing, and he likes it. He uh, he's not. He won't ask for it by name, but when we're watching it, he you know he shuts up. So, uh, but that's the trick is to find the thing that, as a parent, you you don't have a problem with your kid watching and you can enjoy as well. For sure. It's yeah, my parents movie. like they ended up hating like Mighty Ducks and stuff like that because we did that. We always like clung to like a couple Disney movies and a bunch of live action ones. I don't know why. Mighty we Ducks was pretty Mighty awesome. Ducks. Although I didn't watch it, I only saw it like once. Like yeah. all the movies, I saw it one time. We watched Mighty Ducks 2 as well, so it was much worse. Is the t- is 2 the bad one? I don't remember, like, hating uh, any of them. It wasn't... If I saw it now, I would hate myself for liking it so much back then, but kids are dumb, so it's okay. Sometimes it doesn't have to... Like, some things aren't sophisticated, and you just want a simple story. I think it's okay. Yeah. So. Do we have any more it's questions, all- Tony? Because I think it's about time to wrap this baby up. I think we have one more question from Donald Eichvlucht. All right, Mr. Eichvlucht. I haven't heard from him in a while. Yeah. Daylight savings time. 
cool idea or sadistic invention of the man? Uh, the, the latter, clearly. <laughs> Who likes daylight savings time? Farmers. What? Farmers. No. Back just get headlights. up earlier. <laughs> go to yeah, bed earlier. Entire nation. The only nation that has, or the only part of this country that has it right, is Arizona. They're like, no, it's it's too hot to do that. They what now? Arizona, like they don't do the daylight savings. Oh yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Like the day just gets shorter. You don't get more time. Yeah. You don't get more time by moving when it starts. It just gets light at a different time, and then it gets dark super early. <laughs> like, you've moved the morning a little bit earlier, kind of, but yeah. then you've moved and... the, the evening, like, way earlier because the day is shorter. The day didn't move. The day got shorter. And then you're it's like... It's almost gonna... dark in the middle of winter in Colorado uh, because we have the mountains right there. Like we... So... Twilight comes almost an hour earlier because of just like this, the mountains blocking everything. Like, cause they dominate so much of the horizon that it's just like, it, it, once it's down there, like it makes really cool sunsets and things like that, but it definitely takes a lot of your time out of the day. Yeah. When you're getting like, when it's getting dark at three thirty or four, it's just not okay. Yeah. It's not okay. Especially considering that like 80% of people in this country have a vitamin D deficiency. Yeah. We don't get outside enough to even, like, I don't know. Maybe it's just because we're always covered up, too. I'm not walking around outside with my shirt off. <laughs> Probably people thank you for that, Tony. I know they thank me. Yeah, they definitely should. <laughs> my friends are disgusted by that. I should get a stipend for that. That I would, like, that I have skin under my clothes at all. I talked to my <laughs> friend Brantley. I'm like, yeah, when I get home, I'm just like, if there's nobody up, I'm taking my clothes off. And he's like, what is wrong with you? What do you mean, what's wrong with me? It's fun to be naked. See, as soon as I walk in the door, like, before I can even get, like, past my couch, like, always at least pantsless, but I always wear boxers because it's, it's disgusting. Every, everybody else has to sit where you're sitting eventually. I guarantee you, by the, as soon as this video goes off, I'm taking this shirt off. It's coming off. Well, and the shirt underneath it and the pants. You can't even yeah, see the pants. Maybe they're already off. Yeah, you don't they know. already are off. I can assure you, it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway i think that's pretty much everything for this week so if we if you actually see us make sure to watch this on youtube and comment over there and we'll check it out if it works if, out uh, we're gonna we're, this is an er experiment uh so we're trying all kinds of new things but hopefully it'll work out tony's gonna look better in the next one yeah i'll be like you're not gonna look it. better but you're gonna like i be thought in a better place yeah, I thought we were going to be doing, like, a five-minute test, not actually recording everything tonight. So I'm like, oh, I won't shave my head or, like, shave my face or have a clean house or an angle picked out. I'll just test the camera and see what happens. But instead, we're like, hey, let's just do it. It's kind of like how we just started the podcast. We're like, should we do an hour test run? And then we decided to run with it. Well, like I said, we still have the option to scrap this, but we are working on video. If people, you know, if you hear this and you're like, where's the video? It didn't work out, but we're going to keep trying. We will have a video podcast. Yep. So one of the many changes coming soon. Yeah. Look, well, everybody calls this. Everybody, everybody's using the term phase now, Tony. We're we going to have phase two of the Human Echoes podcast. I uh, we could call it phase two, I suppose. Phase one was just like around, around trying to figure until out what was had, going on until we had something, and now it's like now that we're grizzled veterans of the podcast world and have more episodes than ninety percent of the podcasts out there. <laughs> yeah, it's time to move up. It's time to start getting serious. Maybe I'll even go green screen or something. <laughs> like you'll have like, I'm I'm happy with my background. This is all real. This is my, I actually, my room. I, I moved I some stuff around that, so it looked nice. But I look better in low lighting, so you might end up seeing me set up like Queen Bohemian Rhapsody style. I, like it's just kind of a face in the darkness, looking all serious. Who knows? We'll see. I've got I've even done like lighting stuff in here, so I've been like working on this. So I've got my regular light overhead and then I've got the background light just off camera there to like light all this stuff here and get filling on my face. I'm professional. I'm yeah, you can tell that Al's the one who pioneered this because he's comfortable being on camera. Well, that's true too. But you it's okay, Tony. None of us we're not supermodels, all right? Well, that, that that's the that's that's in phase 3 where we have we have the supermodel podcast and we just take our hands off and 
Yeah, like what we're going to do for that point is either we're going to cover ourselves in like green screen stuff so we'll just be buff or we'll actually have <laughs> enough money to hire like personal trainers and get like the Marvel effect like Chris Pratt before and after style. When I said supermodels, I was talking about ladies, Tony. Oh, well, they could be, be somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we could find we could find something. We'll like talk in the earpiece and they'll say the words we were saying. Yeah, we got to like we got to set it up all like keep calm chive on style where it's like sort of a news site, but it's mostly girls taking pictures and selfies of themselves. You know, that's phase three. So stay tuned for that. And if you guys want to start that already, all you dudes out there that listen to this part of the like white dudes with uh, Van Dykes, you can start sending those to at Albert underscore Berg, send those selfies <laughs> or you can send uh, you can find me at T Southcott. I I'll be better without those selfies, but yeah, Albert wants them. <laughs> At HE Podcast for your questions. We'll read them on the air like we always do. If you guys go to humanechoes.com, you can find all of our other stuff. Every Monday, we have cool discussions. Every, like, and then during the week, you get to see videos from us, blog posts, all sorts of cool stuff. We, did, we put a lot of work into this so that you guys can check it out, comment, do all that, subscribe, share it, all that good stuff. If you feel like this is actually worth a dollar, if you feel like it's worth your time and money, there is a subscribe to the PayPal link on the right hand side of the website. You can sign up for a one, five, or ten dollar a month subscription. Anything works, even if it's a one time donation of a dollar. Everything helps. We are so grateful that you guys tune in and listen to us. And thank you so much. We will see you next week with a movie we haven't decided on because we forgot to talk about it. Yeah, we were setting up video stuff. They'll find out. They'll be here. Yeah, you'll hear it on Twitter. Anyway, have a good time or have a good week. Bye, guys. <laughs>